so the, the only way re- I'm going to make a, a parallel and give you an example. And the only reason I think it might be a little bit different is that the the head coach that I'm going to use as an example, was not an offensive minded head coach, but he's very much a control minded head coach. And that's Nick Saban. And I think we all looked around. You're like, wait a second. How in the hell is Nick Saban and Lane Kiffin going to work? How is he going to bring in Lane Kiffin, a guy that's is his own offensive egomaniac? How is that going to work with a guy like, well, it works famously until the very end. And so I looked at this and I said, well, wait a second. Nick bringing in Lane Kiffin won national championships. Is it possible that Jimbo put the ego aside a bit with another offensive minded head coach who's had a lot of success and said, I'm going to give this a run because we haven't been able to catch Alabama. Paul, Brian Kelly and LSU caught AM in year one. Hugh Freeze is now at Auburn. This thing is not getting easier. Lane's at Ole Miss. You've got Texas and Oklahoma coming in. You have to figure something out quick, or this will go down as one of the most expensive hires that didn't work in college football history. I think I think he under listen Jimbo is smart is smart uh, and I think he realized he didn't have many many cards to play and you know we spent all of all, last year uh, on on Sunday morning Matt talking about you know would would they buy him out and it's pretty obvious they did not want to buy him out and I still don't think they do and this gives them a chance to make it and if you're at the if you're from a it's a dangerous move but but I don't think Jimbo Fisher can worry about that I say dangerous because it's easier to fire Jimbo Fisher now. Uh, that you have somebody who's, <laughs> who's able to take over. Uh, you know, this isn't uh, just some garden variety offensive coordinator. So, I, no, but I, I firmly believe uh, A&M does not want to fire Jimbo Fisher. I think they want him there. Uh, and the people with whom I've spoken to that are part of that program say so far it's gone well. Now, that doesn't mean anything. That means that Bobby Petrino's got his parking spot. Uh, he uh, he went through uh, orientation with the HR people, uh, which he probably needed. And, <laughs> and, beyond, and beyond that, uh, they had a pretty decent spring without it, without any uh, controversy. Yeah. And and here's what we know, especially I mean, look, the SEC East for the past however long has been dominated by Georgia. Tennessee appears to be on the rise. Shane Beamer, South Carolina appears to be on the rise. Year two of Billy Napier, will that thing get going? The one thing you can't say is about the SEC West is that it's, look, Alabama has been the, the classic college football for quite some time, but LSU got in there and won a national championship. Ole Miss now under Lane Kiffin is going to compete. Texas A&M has the resources to be at that level just based on recruiting rankings. And as they get into transition with the new offensive play caller, so too does Alabama bringing in Tommy Reese, which, how do I put this? Hmm. It was puzzling. Look, I I think Tommy's a a young football mind, quarterback at Notre Dame, did something special there. But in comes Tommy Reese and Tyler Buckner. And I, I don't know where Alabama is now because this seems so you cover them better than anybody. Did, did, did I read this right? Did this seem bizarre? It, it did. Uh, and I, I think the conundrum at Alabama is this, Matt. Enormous talent. They're still recruiting at a very elite level. But, and, and you can you can just kind of go on for the rest of the day after after I say, but what, but what happens now? And... I, I think you have to have an honest conversation uh, no, for com- for podcasts like this, unlike, you know, Sports Center or unlike uh, what I do, you, you don't have to put the guest on and, and he doesn't have to say, well, Nick Saban is the best. We, we all know that. We all know who Nick Saban is. The question is, where is he today? And I feel confident about Alabama this fall, but uh, for, for all of those people who say, well, they only lost two games last year. Uh, on the last play, they're they're not telling the truth. The, the real picture is they also won two games on the last play and won another game in the last 45 seconds, mm-hmm. uh, and it could have gone badly. Uh, it didn't. Uh, so Nick Saban escaped. Uh, he, he's he's brilliant at that. And and now what happens? And, and I I couldn't tell you about Tyler Buckner. I mean I I don't have enough data to give you an honest opinion. I mean I know what he's good at. I know what he's bad at. Uh, Tommy Reese, same thing. I'll spare you what, what you already know. Uh, puzzling is is being charitable, Matt. 
So before we move on from the SEC, I want to wrap it up with this. SEC Media Days in in a week. Uh, you'll you'll be there. The show will be there. It's gonna be. It's just. It's a. It's an absolute circus. It's a gong show. What Media Days has turned into. Your biggest storyline prior to SEC Media Days is what? I think uh, once you push Kirby Smart's uh, situation off the table, which I think you know it, it will be handled within five minutes. It, it is the. It, it is what happens next with Nick Saban, and can he hold serve against Brian Kelly? Matt, a lot of pundits, which is essentially what Media Day is, is, is about LSU having moved into that position. I don't buy it. Uh, I think Alabama is still very strong. I think the LSU-Alabama game being in Tuscaloosa matters uh, a lot in, in favor of the Crimson Tide. So, uh, But what if we're wrong? What, uh, what if Brian Kelly has really already uh, changed the dynamics in such a short period of time? So I, I'm I'm focused as I usually am on Saban, but but this is without a doubt one of the most intriguing uh, media days with Nick Saban that we've ever had. Could I tempt you with the return of Hugh Freeze back in the SEC? You did can. you think? You, did you think? Hell, two years ago that was even a possibility. You know me; I was the one always saying he needs a second chance, get him back in the league because he knows how to win. But we didn't think it would happen, and here it is. Not only did it happen, he's on the other side of the Iron Bowl now. And, and not only did it happen, Matt, it happened flawlessly. Uh, all the all the hue and cry about what he did or didn't do or why he got fired, it, it was over in five seconds. He handled uh, his, his introduction yep. brilliantly. Uh, I've seen Hugh a couple of times at, at events, and, and he's just very cool. You know Hugh very well. And uh, I, I give him, a, a, you know, an A++. plus plus. For the way he's handled it and not only that the auburn fans are are just enthusiastic really I mean, they're on board now they are on board and and it, it has as much to do with the person he replaced brian harson no 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 debating here whether you know he, he he's a good football coach he was a terrible fit not his fault yeah. he took the job but he he neutered any any level of enthusiasm uh freeze has said you know what i'm I know this league. I'm I'm not afraid of uh, big bad Nick Saban. I've already beaten him twice. Uh, I can handle these guys, and and Auburn fans are just clapping and screaming and and chanting and and think that they're back. Uh, you know, and, and you know, it doesn't. It won't take much for Hugh Freeze to to seal that deal. Uh, and and I think he's got a good chance of doing it. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube for live streaming sports and premium content. Subscribe to ESPN Plus.